amazing stories, amazing impact, real life. As we said in, in the morning, I think the stigma is coming off more and more and more. And I think after every panel, after every discussion, it's uh, coming and coming off stronger and stronger. So thank you to, to all, the, all the presenters and all the participants and all the panels. I think collectively, the situation looks better and better every minute. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome on stage the first partner of California, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Jennifer is a documentary filmmaker, an actress, and an advocate known among her many important activities for her work on mental health, female representation, and gender equality. Through her films, advocacy, and influential role as the first partner, Jennifer strives to disrupt gender narratives and promote mental well-being, working towards a society that values inclusive stories and accessible mental health resources. First partner. Mere days before my seventh birthday, I experienced the horrific loss of my older sister Stacy. In minutes, my entire life changed, and I lost my best friend, my confidant and my role model. My parents did their best, in stoic Nordic fashion, to return to some semblance of normal. My mom gave birth to two more girls. We spent a year living with horses and wild animals in Montana. And we even attempted family therapy, once. But inside, I was broken. I spent years blaming myself, punishing myself, trying to be two daughters instead of one. The unresolved trauma and survivor's guilt still haunt me to this day. Kids are our best teachers, reflecting back to us what we often don't see. So it wasn't until my youngest son was days away from his seventh birthday that I realized how pure and innocent he was and how unfair it was of me to put so much guilt, shame, and pressure on myself. I tell this story because it is a personal reminder of how essential it is that we end the stigma around mental health and provide young people and their families with mental health resources at the earliest of ages when and where they need them. The leading cause of children's hospitalizations in California happened to be mental health related. And the CDC found that 60% of teen girls and 69% of LGBTQ plus youth report feelings of sadness and hopelessness. One in three teen girls have seriously considered suicide. This is a crisis, one that has been exacerbated globally by climate change, culture wars, wealth inequality, structural racism, political divisiveness, a global pandemic, and a growing and unhealthy reliance on smartphones and social media. Last month, US Surgeon General Vivek Murthy issued an advisory warning about social media's impact on developing young brains, stating that youth mental health is the defining public health issue of our time, and that there isn't enough evidence to show that social media platforms are safe for young kids and teens. I couldn't agree more. The advent of social media has brought with it unprecedented challenges. In-person relationships and community were still the norm and valued in America in 2010, but as we all began spending more time online, isolation and disconnection grew. Today, we have 24-7 access to unrealistic, filtered, and pornographic images, hateful and shameful rhetoric, and misinformation campaigns on these addictive smartphones that we carry with us everywhere we go. Adults can barely handle this. Children certainly cannot. Think about it for a second. 
exposing children and adolescents to near constant toxicity while their emotional regulation, critical thinking skills, and cognition are still in development is supremely dangerous. I imagine you all know this. Perhaps it's why you are here. I'm here because we are at a precipice when it comes to youth mental health. And in the absence of a United States national youth mental health strategy, California is breaking down barriers between health, education, and social services and building a comprehensive system that meets the needs of all Californians ages zero to 26. My husband, California Governor Gavin Newsom, has invested $4.7 billion to make this system a reality. These investments include training of 25,000 additional behavioral health professionals and 16,000 young people who can explore careers in behavioral health. It also includes training for teachers on early warning signs and trauma-informed care, and $20,000 scholarships for mental health workers that spend at least two years working in a school. This expansion of the behavioral health system ensures all California children are routinely assessed, served, and supported. And we all know an overhaul like this takes time. So California is taking a multi-pronged approach now to holistically meet the needs of our children. The truth is either we ourselves or close loved ones will be in need of mental health support at some point in our lives. And while not every child will need clinical mental health services, they will all reap the benefits of prevention and anti-stigma efforts that help build a life of wellness, providing tools if and when a crisis arises. This is why I started a California for All Kids initiative in 2019. As a mother of four children, two daughters and two sons, the governor and I understood that physical and mental health are inextricably linked and that both contribute to our kids' overall well-being. When developing California for All Kids, I thought back to my time at Montessori Preschool. We explored nature on daily walks with Mrs. Twilliger. We made fresh lunches using ingredients from our school garden. And we cared for animals in the classroom. Those experiences were fundamental in healing my own trauma. To this day, time in nature and care of loved ones and animals are part of my self-care routine. And so I knew we had to bring a similar model to California in order to give children the best start in life. Given the correlation between the food that our children consume and their mood, cognition, and well-being, we began working on the California Farm to School initiative. Farm to School and California's nation-leading universal school meals programs work collaboratively to ensure that California students have access to two free, delicious, nutritious, and locally sourced meals a day. To date, Farm to School programming has reached an estimated 1.5 million students across the state. We've also implemented programs such as the California State Library Parks Pass to break down financial barriers and increase equitable access to over 200 state parks. Anyone with a California library card can check out a Parks Pass for free. This is critical and reinforces the time in nature is healing. The Governor's Advisory Council on Physical Fitness and Mental Well-Being, which I co-chair, also builds upon this work. Through the Council, we're addressing youth mental health by promoting evidence-based daily mindfulness and movement for Californians of all ages. We're also working diligently to address the mental health impacts of isolation and loneliness by promoting the use of public parks and spaces to bolster health, community, and belonging. As we know, a consistent barrier to care is knowing where to find it. 
To that, California has broken out of its bureaucratic silos and housed connections to mental health resources from across state agencies and nonprofit partners under one roof on our California Health and Human Services website. Many of the resources are multilingual to ensure that language isn't a barrier to care. One of the tools on the Resource Hub that I'm most proud of is the California Healthy Minds Thriving Kids Project. We partnered with the Child Mind Institute to develop this amazing evidence-based bilingual video series and curricula for youth, parents, and educators to utilize in their daily lives. These include education around understanding thoughts and feelings, how to manage intense emotions, breath work, and other relaxation techniques. This past January, this series had reached over 72,000 educators in California and an estimated 1.8 million students. And in January, we will launch a virtual services platform to provide California youth and parents with screenings and assessments, on-demand coaching, and connections to other virtual and in-person services. So I'm here to tell you that while we are building the plane as we fly it, working through a crisis, and redesigning an entire behavioral health system, I have hope. Hope in the California dream, and all of the investments that we've made towards prevention and improving our children's well-being. And as someone who believes fully in the power of partnership, my title and a common theme in my work, I feel grateful to all of you for being here and for your commitment to mental health, and especially to Andrea Strakopoulos and SNF. Together, we are united around an essential goal, the holistic well-being of the world's children, and that is something worth fighting for. So now we're gonna move on over here and I get to ask one of the governors and my most valued partners to join me on stage, Dr. Mark Galley, Secretary of California Health and Human Services Agency and a brilliant leader on youth behavioral health. Please welcome Mark. <laughs> Dr. Galley, you wear many hats. You are a father of four, you are a pediatrician, and California's Health and Human Services Secretary. And you were, you were our Dr. Fauci <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, given your unique perspective on youth behavioral health, will you share with us why the overhaul of California's system is so important? Well, uh, first partner, first, thank you for including me in this conversation. Exciting to be here, to see the energy around youth mental health in particular, mental health in general, something we've been hungry for back home and leading the way. Uh, I would say first off, you used the word overhauling the system. And today in California, young people wake up and expect to go to school because we have a system for schooling our young people. They expect to get at least two meals a day because so many are going hungry, but we have that system. We even have a system for physical health for all kids in California, but we haven't had a system that's been reliable. Kids wake up every day asking questions, just like April did. Where am I gonna get the support? Where am I going to get answers to questions? Where am I gonna get the help? And for us, making sure that Californians, millions of children, have a reliable, trusted way to get that support, whether it's on the backs of our schools, on our communities, our clinicians, we have that hope that anyone zero to 26, wherever you are, northern, southern part of our state, whether English is your first language or if it isn't, that you get that service reliably. And we believe that by building that system, we're not only helping support the young people and families of today, but we're building a system that's going to allow us, as a pediatrician, I know that my patients stand up in class, willingly go to their teachers and say, 
may I be excused to go to my doctor's appointment. But our young people aren't doing that for their mental health help. The stigma is rich and real, and this system we hope is gonna help break it down. So, um, so and they, we, we only have a little bit more time, but I, I really wanna um, jump into that California is doing more to lead in the realm of mental health, which is new and fresh um, that folks might not know about. Earlier this week, the governor announced major changes to the Mental Health Services Act, and I was wondering if you could share with us the current status and why it's so critical now. So This man's taken on so much, and he's an incredible leader. We're so grateful to have him. 20 years ago, California chose to uh, add another tax in California on millionaires, and that tax brings in about three and a half to four billion dollars a year to help support mental health services. This was before we had the Affordable Care Act that President Obama put in place that guaranteed health care to millions of Californians that didn't have it before, before we had concepts around equal treatment between behavioral health, mental health, in particular, and physical health. So 20 years later, we decided it needed to be modernized, refreshed, a focus on making sure our most sick, our most severely impacted populations with behavioral health conditions, and we're very deliberate to use behavioral health. It was originally the Mental Health Services Act, but in recognition of the value and importance of ensuring that substance use disorders are included, we are refreshing this law to make sure that those with serious and disabling substance use disorders alone can receive the care, that housing is an important part of what those dollars can be used to pay for, multidisciplinary, evidence-based programming that recognizes that in 20 years, conference rooms like this one, uh, 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 research institutions, community-based practices have evolved and really trying to make sure that California isn't stuck in two decades old policies and procedures, but rather making sure that we're current and, and, and building a system that Californians who, like the rest of the world, desperately need the care and support that I think we're all hungry to see, we're able to build it up more. So the courage of you and the governor, not just in our youth focus, but broadly in behavioral health uh, for California gives me a great deal of hope that uh, this modernization plus so many other things that you have led are going to give us a real opportunity to transform not just our own state, but hopefully the nation and partner with the world. I agree. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Dr. Galley. Thanks to all of you here and online. This has been a pleasure. Thank you.